Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Prevention Plus, who is organizing this great session. And from the Global Secretariat, and much greetings. And I will just pass over to Damian for continuing. Yeah, no, I will take it over. Oh, hello, hello. <laughs> no, that's okay. totally fine. Hello, <laughs> um, hello everyone. Um, we're going to start. Um, I think people are still dropping in, um, but, but uh, uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, welcome to this event called um, Creating Lasting Change in GBV Programming, Learnings on Sustainability in the Prevention Plus Program. We have a, a very nice interactive program lined up for you. Um, we really hope that you will enjoy it. Um, I'm Harald Kedde, uh, Senior Researcher at Rutgers, and I, I will be your chairperson today. And uh, I'm not alone, of course. I'm here together with Dr. Damien Hatton, our lead researcher from InFocus, who together with his team conducted the final evaluation for Prevention Plus. And I'm also here with Brian Halman, Senior Researcher at Promondo US, and we will be having seven speakers today from all over the world who will join our event. Uh, we have Anna-Marie Desentier from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and she will open the session. And we have five speakers who were directly involved in the program, and they will tell us about their experiences and successes over the past five years. And we have Tom Koonen, CEO of Rutgers, and he will give his closing comments. And with today's event, we would like to give you insights based on the final evaluation of Prevention Plus and how to make the programs that run interventions with men and boys to prevent GBV more sustainable in the long run. And also, how can we make uh, the institutionalization of gender transformative approaches most successful? So we've got a few housekeeping uh, things. Um, you can choose your preferred language in Zoom. Um, so you have to hit the globe button and then you can change your language. Please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Um, if you have a question specifically to our speakers, please put your question in the chat box throughout the event. There's a Q&A at the end. We will aim to either answer them during the Q&A session or otherwise we will do this afterwards. Uh, if you have a technical question, we also have Kelly Crawshaw here as well. Um, so please put your question in the chat box as well, and she can help you out. And this session will be recorded in case you want to watch it later again or pass it on to others who might be interested. And if you wish, it is possible to rename yourself with your name and organization. You can do this by hovering over your face with your mouse and clicking the three dots. You can select rename. Um, and then the subtitles. We have subtitles available. Um, these are in English, Spanish, and French, and these are provided by Wordly, and these are computer-generated translations. It will not be perfect, but we hope it provides more options for you to follow the discussion. Um, and as mentioned, we've got a very nice and interactive program lined up for you. In total, it will take 90 minutes. We will start with an introduction on Prevention Plus and what we mean by sustainability, followed by an outline on the approach of Prevention Plus on sustainability and what lessons we have learned over the past five years. And as mentioned, we will have a variety of speakers from Prevention Plus countries who will tell us about their experiences and successes with their work. And as said, this will be an interactive session. We will do several picture games. We will use Mentimeter and there's a Q&A at the end uh, so um, we can go back and forth. So that's the technical side out of the way. Um, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker uh, of today and that is Anna-Marie Desenche. Anna-Marie is our policy officer at the Task Force Women's Rights and Gender Equality of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs has funded the Prevention Plus program, and Anna-Marie will say a few words on behalf of the Ministry before we start this session. Over to you, Anna-Marie. Thank you, uh, Harold. And thank you to the Rutgers team for inviting me uh, to join and briefly give some remarks. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure seeing meetings like these being organized. It's a great way to uh, celebrate achievements, but also to continue linking and learning in these challenging times of COVID-19. So this is great. 
Um, as we are all aware, gender inequality is one of the most serious forms of discrimination as it keeps women and girls from reaching their full potential, keeps them in poverty and at risk and deprives them from their basic rights. Yet there's no country in the world that achieved full gender equality. Due to lockdowns and isolation measures, it has become even more important to work on combating violence against women as many of these women have been trapped with their abuser. Also in the Netherlands, violence against women and girls remains a serious problem. In March, UNESCO estimated that a pandemic was preventing 1.5 billion children from attending school, and some of them will never return. The lockdown and school closures also means that women face an increase uh, in their unpaid care work. Responsibilities concerning domestic duties fall disproportionately on women. And besides that, women's access to paid work has diminished due to the pandemic. However, focusing on COVID-19 gives the false impression that before the pandemic, women's conditions were improving. It suggests that the pandemic is responsible for a rapid reverse of decades of steady progress concerning women's rights and gender equality. But prior to March 2020, women's rights already faced a global pushback from fund uh, fundamentalism and conservatism. Even more, for women in poverty and conflict areas, gender inequalities tend to deepen as they have a reinforcing effect on each other. Therefore, we must keep investing in the empowerment of women and girls, as well as countering gender inequality. At the ministry, we have several frameworks, funding frameworks for program working on these themes. We will continue with Leading from the South and uh, we'll start in 2021 with Power of Women, seven new programs focusing on financing women's rights organizations and giving voice to Southern led organizations. We will also start with Power of Voices with four uh, programs working in the area of women's rights and gender equality. And as I'm correct, Rutgers will be a partner in the consortium Generation G. Uh, also, the Netherlands, together with Canada, Malawi, and a consortium of NGOs, leads the Gender Equality Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership. We support investing in women's movements and organizations, not only through our programming, but also in our gender diplomacy. On behalf of, uh, of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I can say that we are proud to have been in a partnership with Rutgers. Women's rights and gender equality is a cross-cutting theme within the ministry as it touch up, uh, touches upon so many topics and is essential to achieve sustainable development worldwide. It's a pleasure to look back with all of you to what have been achieved in the five years of the program. Focusing on addressing inequalities between women and men by working with men to be agents of change in promoting healthy masculinities based on equality, caregiving and non-violence has become a priority and is vital to building inclusive and sustainable societies. Prevention plus gender transformative approach is a key strategy for this by actively examining, questioning and changing rigid gender norms and imbalances of power involving young men and men in strategic partnerships with communities, public institutions and civil society organizations to achieve positive and equal gender norms and reduce men's use of gender-based violence. Across Indonesia, Uganda, Rwanda and Lebanon, youth make up a large part of the population. This presents immense opportunities, but also serious challenges. The Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs wants to offer the new generation breadth of prospects. What we've learned during the last uh, five years of programming in the area of women empowerment and gender equality is that women and men are key in it, uh, to eliminate inequality. I think this is also clearly shown in the work of Prevention Plus. It is crucial for a new paradigm of gender equality to address both men and women rather than a constant framing of men as perpetrators of inequality and women as survivors of this inequality. The focus of your program namely eliminating, eliminating gender-based violence was and will remain one of the focus areas of the Dutch Development Corporation policy. I'm looking forward to attending today's meeting and hear more about the lessons learned. Also, the ministry is looking forward to continue with Rutgers in the new Power of Voices fund. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna-Marie for your words and your uh, introduction. Um, I would like to give the floor now to uh, Damien Hatton, 
our lead researcher of the final evaluation of Prevention Plus. Thank you, Harold, and uh, welcome to everybody uh, listening in from around the world. My name is Damien Hatton, as Harold said, from uh, InFocus Consulting, and I supported uh, the evaluation uh, over the last 12 month period and uh, have been had the privilege of working closely with the consortia of partners from, um, from Rutgers, from Sonka Gender Justice and from under US, as well as all of the in-country implementation partners doing the work on the ground as well. Um, some of who we're going to uh, hear from a little, uh, a little later on. So what I'm going to do just now is give a bit of an introduction to Prevention Plus and a bit of an overview, first of all, in terms of the aims and scope of the program, and what we're aiming, what we were aiming to do as um, as evaluators of the program in terms of what questions we were looking to answer. I'm then going to run through diff the different interventions and some of the main outcomes from the program um, over the course of the last five years before we get into the main body of our presentation, which is really concerning uh, program sustainability and some of the key recommendations that emerged from uh, the evaluation in terms of how sustainability might be further promoted. Um, and we believe that these recommendations might have some you know, broader relevance to, to, the, to the wider sector as well, um, to be able to better understand and create more sustainable programs. So in terms of the aims of Prevention Plus pro, uh, program, in general, um, Prevention Plus is seeking to address issues of gender and inequality through interventions that target men and uh, as both partners of women and agents of change. Uh, the program model had a focus on four main interlinking long-term outcomes. So at the individual and relationship level, men and women uh, have having violence-free and gender equal relationships. At the community level, where communities were hold, could hold equitable gender norms and prevent GBV. And at the institutional level, where public institutions and civil society organizations have institutionalized gender transformative approaches and promote gender justice. And what we mean by institutionalization there is that organizations themselves are becoming um, part of the process of change where they themselves are actively seeking opportunities to challenge gender norms and promote diversity and address inequalities. And then finally, in terms of the government level, uh, creating an enabling environment at both the national and international level to prevent GBV by engaging men and boys to support gender justice. In terms of the scope of Prevention Plus, um, it comprised evidence-based programming at a multi-country scale. So we had Uganda, Rwanda, Lebanon and Indonesia all working across four socio-ecological levels, both the individual, the community, the institutional and government levels in order to sort of con contribute to sort of sustainable transformation of norms and practices at all levels across those societies. So this is in fact one of the key planks to sustainability that the programme actually adopted overall. In terms of our evaluation, and uh, it was structured around three guiding questions. So the first question was around strategy areas. To what extent did the particular divining strategies of Prevention Plus succeed as originally designed? The second guiding question was around institutionalization and sustainability. How successful has Prevention Plus been in terms of institutionalization? of gender transformative approaches. And the third area was around accountability and core, core program principles. And how have the project principles as established in at the outset to the program actually contributed to the prevention uh, plus program objectives. And by pro project principles, we mean things like promoting women's rights or being accountable to the women's rights movement, and these were being basically used by the country partners as a reference point to guide their programmatic strategies, which were essentially very different on the ground, but unified through a set of coherent principles, which everybody was following and trying to integrate into the programs. 
Now, today's workshop is for, uh, really focusing in on question two, um, but we'll be using insights from across the evaluation findings to look at the issue of program sustainability. Now, we're going to use a tool called Mentimeter, where we'll be getting your feedback and thoughts during the presentation. Um, and we're going to drop into the chat just now a link to Mentimeter. So if you just follow the link, um, the link on Mentimeter, um, you'll be brought up a screen like a little bit like this. Um, if you're actually playing, if you're actually sat around a computer with a bunch of people, you can actually follow follow the um, go to the URL here www.menti.com and use the just drop the code in. You'll get to the same question screen as well. Um, so if you followed that link or managed to get uh, get to the website, you should be seeing the first question. And perhaps the most critically important question. I am final there. <laughs> Hello, is that is that Bishop Bishop Paul? Yeah, 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 yeah. I am finally connected. I'm sorry for Fantastic. the <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Wonderful. Yes, I'm glad I'm now part of the the meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, wonderful. Thank you. We're we're on Mentimeter right now. Yeah, we are now proceed. Thank you very much. So in a, you should get to this first question about which kitten is the cutest. Um, so we have four aspiring kittens and I just like to open up. Yes. Voting. There we go. There we go. So we Thank can you. see. Image one, image four, neck and neck. Oh, hang on, we've got a image one pulling slightly ahead. So who's gonna get Men Engaged Symposium cutest kitten? Okay, we're gonna close that voting, but hopefully you get the point. Uh, we do have a winner, it is image one. Um, the, the, the kind of roaring lion look of kitten one seems to have won everybody over. Um, so what's nice about Mentimeter is that we can see everybody's results displayed automatically on the screen. So it's a great tool to use to really get some interactive um, feedback as we go. So um, a slightly less highbrow question now than our kitten question. What country are you actually calling in from? So I'm again, I'm just going to give, uh, in fact, I'm only going to give 30 seconds for this answer, just to get a sense of who's actually here and where's everybody calling in from. Ah, there we go. See how nice, nice this is, displaying live. So big presence from the Netherlands today, followed by Indonesia, Cape Town, South Africa, Rwanda, USA, Belgium. Now, if I was tapping in there, we've got Mozambique, and. Uh, India, Hungary, so a wonderful display of the diversity of people who are calling in today on today's call. Okay, thanks very much. We're going to be using Mentimeter on and off during this presentation. So um, we'll, come, we'll be coming back to Mentimeter as we go through. So what I'm going to now move on to is presenting in a little bit more detail, but still on a very general and kind of program wide level. What kind of interventions were being undertaken across the four countries? So um, we again, we were sort of looking at this from the, the program interventions were designed to really address at this uh, across the socio ecological model. Um, which is displayed in front of you. And let's start with the individual level where we're really working with men, boys, women's girls and partners and family relationships. And many of the interventions here were kind of collaboratively promoting and encouraging conversations on GBV prevention in a range of different innovative ways across all four countries towards violence-free and gender-just relations. 
And the main four outcomes that we saw across all four countries were that more gender equitable attitudes were emerging amongst men and boys. There was an increased division of household labor. There were healthier intimate partner relationships and there was increased positive parenting practices. Now at the community level, again, working with community relations, men and boys and women and girls. Um, here, the projects, the program was trying to enlist the support of locally trusted community leaders and religious re leaders to be more active role models and lead some of the change processes towards communities promoting themselves equal gender norms and preventing GBV. And the three main outcomes that we really saw, again, at a program level, were communities experiencing a shift in attitudes with much more open dialogue towards gender-based violence topics and subject matters. Community leaders and men as were acting as role models, were promoting gender just and equitable values. And in most contexts, there was also increased awareness and access to survivors, uh, services for survivors. Now, when we look at the institutional level, now institutions, we were across all four countries, there was a combination of different institutions from religious and cultural institutions, police, prisons, probation, schools and universities, the media itself, legal and judiciary system, CSOs and networks. And these interventions were designed to really train staff within these institutions to implement a gender transformative approach. Some of the main insights we had across the evaluation was that the predominant strategy across all countries was actually around strengthening and, with, uh, and working with the pre-existing structures and institutions that supported Prevention Plus aims, as opposed to kind of creating new structures or new institutions to lead this process. The development of learning materials for ongoing knowledge transfer and program management was an important aspect of the whole overall process. Having those materials, a rich source of data and information to pass on to, to different institutions and bring it to life. And in most cases, the institu institutionalization process was ongoing. It didn't just stop with one training. It was a real recognition it had to continue. Different actors began to take on new roles in line with their increased involvement and engagement in GBV at the institutional level. And relationships between actors were being strengthened with increased collaboration and knowledge sharing amongst them all. And what I wanted to share was a few examples of, of key successes you know, at the country level now, because those are kind of general findings across all countries. I've only picked a, a one or two for each country due to time, but in Uganda, there was the creation of a common forum for different faith groups, which led to much greater collaboration and a synchronization of religious leaders' efforts to prevent GBV. And we're privileged to have um, Bishop Paul Kipto a little bit later speaking about his work, uh, uh, work in this area that he's been, he, he's been instrumental in leading. In Rwanda, we've got, um, there was a training of the media that enhanced the understanding of the role journalists can play in transforming practices around GBV. In Indonesia, there was training and advocacy work with the Imams and Pangula and Pangulu in the Kua, which is the religious affairs office uh, for Indonesia um, and contributed to more equitable attitudes and practices concerning both the roles of both men and women. And in Lebanon, CSOs were trained on Program App, which um, acquired and subsequently acquired knowledge and skills that was applicable to both their gender work. And it was also felt actually one of the strong things that I could apply it to their own personal relationships as well. So that's just a taste of what was going on at the institutional level and some of the key insights. Again, the fourth level, of this kind of multi-tiered approach to catalyzing change was the government level where public services, GBV prevention and response systems were being targeted, as well as the health, education, justice and social affairs sectors, different in different places, um, in different countries, a different, slightly different emphasis, but a, a broad swathe of governmental type institutes. And this was about involved, uh, 
involvement in national advocacy actions to generate policy and legislative changes on GBV prevention and gender equality. So again, some of the insights that Kate were coming through, the continuation of some program activities or partnerships was, as you can imagine, very dependent upon governmental support, um, which was at risk throughout 2020 from political upheaval and or change and is going to be a, you know, a, an ongoing feature. There was increased access to resources within the GBV system. So, for example, in Uganda, there was increased allocation of budget for actors in one region. And there was also uh, examples of much greater resource sharing within the GBV system um, taking place to, to kind of plug different gaps that, that, uh, that one institute could, could cover that others couldn't. So again, some key, some simple examples from each country um, of, of work that was, uh, of outcomes that were occurring through um, at this governmental level. So in Uganda, there was work with the Ministry of Education, which led to the production of seven manuals with content based on Programme P to be rolled out across Uganda. And there were advocacy efforts supporting uh, the development of a national family policy, which was in draft format at the time of the evaluation. Um, and the re-emergence of a national set of national parenting guidelines and the development of a local ordinance on alcohol consumption. Um, in Indonesia, there was collaboration with local government uh, that led to the formation of a GBV task force. And there was training regarding casework being carried out with the police and a counselling service um, according to a written standard operating procedure. Um, that was piloted in parallel with advocacy work for its wider rollout as well. And we're going to be hearing from, um, from Ibu Emma shortly, um, uh, the assistant superintendent um, within the Indonesian uh, police force about that work in a short while. In Rwanda, there's been work on the parent evening dialogue sessions. Again, you'll hear from a couple of our speakers uh, from Rwamrek who've been leading on this parent evening dialogue work. And this was strongly embedded into the district development strategies right the way up to 2024, and therefore represented a key plank, again, to the program strategy for sustainability. And in Lebanon, there was um, some images, some research done called Images, and a conference that focused upon the sociocultural norms about gender and masculinity, which contributed directly to advocacy, and programming development in the, both the region and capacity work across the region as well. So a few examples just to give you a sense of kind of the broad and breadth of scope of different outcomes that were taking place through the program um, across all four countries. So what do we mean by um, program sustainability? So we've looked at sustainability from three, three, um, three definitions that we're using here. Um, and under which we'll be grouping our recommendations that we'll go through in a moment. So the first is community sustainability. So how the community level changes will actually persist and continue to evolve both with and through the community members themselves. So how is that being um, passed through all the in, in, informal uh, channels within community beyond the scope of the programming? The second area is institutionalization of a gender transformative approach. So how do these pre-existing institutions that we've been talking about, the police, the probation services that have been trained, continue to replicate and deliver those gender transformative interventions beyond the life cycle of prevention plus programming? And kind of the third aspect was uh, of sustainability was, you know, through the systems wide thinking. So, uh, which we see as a means to catalyzing change across all levels of the socio-ecological model. So how is that also being promoted further? So those are the three areas um, we were going to look at. And I'm gonna just flick on to our next question on Mentimeter at this juncture in time. And um, I will just launch this question, give you a minute to think, well, 30 seconds to think through the question and then 
30 seconds to get your answer in there. What do you think might be the biggest challenge to the sustainability of a program like Prevention Plus? So we've got a couple of, you know, straight up there, most obvious instant answers, which is great. COVID-19 and shortage of funding. What else might be a challenge here? Okay, so we've got some coming in, ingrained sexism in all actors, national political change, changes of government, administration priorities. People fall back to old behaviors and attitudes, underlying norms, policy choice, political opposition, staff turnover within our organizations, lack of community awareness, Three, two, one, voting is over. Great, some, so some, some, some insights there as to what everybody's thinking in the room, virtual room, should I say, about you know, what are the challenges that, that are being experienced when it comes to sustainability. So from one tool to another, we're going to actually now, um, we're gonna play a, a bit of a game um during this next segment and we're going to present under each of those three categories that i just mentioned of sustainability a few recommendations um which were primarily directed towards prevention plus um program teams and partners to enhance the future sustainability of the program but we think there are you know there are going to be some interesting insights here too for the wider field so we can look at it from the from both those perspectives but we're going to make it a bit of a guessing game. So um, not least to just try and keep everybody awake, but also to sort of stir the gray, gray cells a little bit. Um, so there are a number of general recommendations that we're going to make, and we have included some images to represent the recommendation. The game we're going to play is to look at the images and write into the Zoom chat what recommendation you think it represents. So I'm going to give you an example here just to get you going. Um, here we've got a guy um, scratching his head, looking at um, kind of dartboard type thing with a target, arrows shooting at it, looks a bit confused. For example here, this isn't a recommendation, by the way, but it's an example. Mm -hmm make the aims and objectives of the program clearer to key stakeholders. So a bit of lateral thinking required in some of these images. So let's play our game. Let's see if we can come up with um, our recommendations. So do please uh, drop into the chat. Harold's manning the chat um, and, uh, and we'll read out your, your answers. So in terms of that idea of community sustainability, um, Here's our first images, and I'm just going to give you 30 seconds to come up with what's our recommendation here around community sustainability. I'll give you some think time. And me some drink a bit of water time. We've got collaborate, collaborate, more formative research with the target community. From Savita, we've got participation. From ADRO, we've got partnerships with community-based organizations. Oswaldo, use evidence to inform your plans. Um, Era building narrative based on research and inclusivity. So all good, good answers. And uh, so I'm gonna reveal, the big reveal on this one is the need to do targeted research to really understand different community needs um, and levels of understanding of, of gender issues and gender terminology, as well as um, research into identifying key community leaders and better understanding certain mechanisms of change. So these are kind of all under the heading of targeted research, because we found, um, for example, that there's a, a real lexicon and diversity of language around gender, which some terminology might be ad adopted, but actually fundamentally misunderstood. Um, so how are people interpreting uh, some of this language, some of these concepts that are being 
being taught in, in, within the community. Okay, so targeted research, that was a bit tricky. I started you off at the deep end. So we've got number two here. What's this recommendation pointing towards here? Again, I'll give you 30 seconds just to have a go at that one. Again, just drop into chat. So as well, though, we've got adopt a holistic approach and consider, oh gosh, lots of things coming in here. Um, adopt a holistic approach and consider diverse factors, sharing learning with the community, joint design to inform joint work, reflection and brainstorming brings fruits on the tree of community. I love that, Dominique. Um, open discussions to ensure diversity of participants. Absolutely. So we've got a lot of diversity coming. I can't really read out all your comments. I'm sorry, they're all coming in so fast and furious. But this one is really pointing towards the need for consideration to be given to the need for alternative strategies to service provision that will allow and incorporate greater sexual and gender diversity within program sites. Um, that's what each of the countries uh, found a little bit challenging. Um, not least because in some places, both the law um, as well as the kind of community taboos really um, stood against um, the, the, the ability to, to, to just incorporate um, greater sexual gender uh, and gender diversity into the programming. Um, I really pointed to a, need, a sensitivity around this area and a need for maybe alternate strategies, alternate funding sources to really service um, that broader, more diverse group, and, and also touched on uh, disability as well, in terms of uh, the need for more disabled provision within the program. Okay, our third one under this list. This is our third and final, and then we're going to go on and you're going to hear from one of our great speakers. So what's our third one here? And I'll just give you, so support families, we've got support services. Yeah. Strength and enhanced capacities of all actors. Continuous learning. See, what we're getting out of all this is all your great recommendations as well. So these are all things that you could be doing to strengthen that community piece indeed. Continuous learning and support, teaching and learning at all ages will give life, uh, will give life to healthy families, gender mainstreaming, capacity building. Okay, some great answers there. This was not obvious. <laughs> so provide ongoing safeguarding training. This is one thing that came up. Um, you know, with some of the risks involved in this work at both the individual and community community level, both in terms of, um, for example, travel um, to and transportation of female participants to counselling and other services, the risk of backlash, which was, um, you know, very real and a real consequence from both men and women um, as a consequence of, you know, their participation in, in, in some aspect of the programming. There were risks and safeguarding issues around staff going into um, certain certain venues and, 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 and considerations around personal safety and welfare, breaches of privacy. So a whole range of different safeguarding issues to consider. And as vehicles to change were the community volunteers and facilitators and community themselves, um, you know, having modules to really train those, uh, those partners on safeguarding was an important aspect. Final one without pictures here was develop lighter touch ways of post intervention. So after an intervention has taken place, how you can continue to support participants 
as well as new role models, which was a feature that I mentioned during the outcomes, new people, new actors playing new roles. How do you continue to support them with further interventions, perhaps lighter touch than the program ab and the, the core programming to really help them translate new knowledge into real behavior change and ensure men become allies and visible allies for change. So that was another sort of um, important recommendation that emerged. Okay, over to you, Brian. Sure. Thanks so much, Damien. And I think this has been a really uh, great overview to that first category of types of sustainability that we were able to, I think, achieve through Prevention Plus. <laughs> but of course, like with a program that is taking place on four different countries, different regions, different contextual realities all at once, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to even just conceptualize this multi-pronged program that looks different in each country. Uh, but even still those kind of gathering together some high level recommendations about the need of formative and community-based research about safeguards for participant safety and staff safety and those other ones really apply across uh, all of these different communities but for each of the three bubbles of the types of sustainability we're going to have at least one speaker to give you that more grounded contextual country reality. And for this community section, we wanted to turn to our Lebanon team, and that means Abad. And I'm gonna turn it over to Anthony Kivi in just a second, who's the masculinities technical advisor and leader of masculinities thinking at Abad. And Anthony, uh, welcome. Thank you for all your and your team's amazing work throughout the five years of Prevention Plus. And I just wanna turn it over to you for a handful of minutes now and ask you, Really, how was the Abad team, especially like in a tumultuous context over the past few years in Lebanon, able to work with, in partnership with, and within communities, especially on the fatherhood components of, of, of the work? And take that in whatever direction you, you prefer in terms of exploring the sustainability side. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you, uh, everyone, for having us with you uh, to speak for a few minutes today. Um, as, as, as you said, Brian, most of our work on Prevention Plus was around the development of a new manual. Uh, in English, this is called Program PECD, which is the fatherhood manual that focuses more on early childhood development than did the original Program P that was developed uh, uh, with, with our wonderful partners, Promundo. And it was about implementations of a program, Eb, we called it, which Eb means father in Arabic. And it was training other NGOs, as we saw earlier, for them to be able to carry out the trainings, uh, working within communities to give the knowledge of what it means to work on gender equality with mothers and fathers. The training includes mothers and fathers. We talk about shifting from patriarchal notions of masculinity, especially within the role as fathers, to more equitable versions of masculinity. We're able to triangulate the changes that are happening with men through their spouses, and, and we got some really wonderful results. But if with the few minutes that I have to really focus on community and sustainability, uh, I would just like to share perhaps one uh, outcome that, that we experienced in, in Lebanon. Uh, this year was an extremely turbulent year for, for Lebanon. Not only did we deal with COVID-19, but there was the Beirut explosion. Uh, and the, the year started with a revolution in the country in, in October, uh, where masses of Lebanese people uh, took to the streets to talk about political corruption and theft. And during this period, many roads were shut down, and there was really a, a collective feeling of fear, anxiety, anger, that, that really resonated throughout the entire country and, and through everyone within the country. And during this period, it was actually quite dangerous to, to be on the roads, to be going to different places. And at first we were, we, we were quite worried about what that meant for the implementations that we were still carrying out on, on Barnei And we were extremely surprised with how many members of the community that we were working with that asked us not to stop carrying out the implementations and who worked with us to try to find safe ways that our beneficiaries and, and our participants and our partners from the community could make it to, this, to the sites and the spaces where, where this gender work was taking place. And it was really 
very uplifting that that this went beyond simply a program or or a, a, a discussion session weekly that was happening. They were really benefiting. Men were benefiting from the opportunity to discuss with other men from their communities and with us the ways that patriarchal masculinity has shaped their own lives and perceptions of fatherhood and how much they are learning and taking on into their private lives and spreading that, that information to other men in the communities and how much women were experiencing change in their own personal lives and, and that, that feeling of, of collective strength of all of us working towards this goal is one of the strongest senses of, of community that I've, I've had throughout all of my years of working. And, and specifically in working with refugee or other marginalized populations, they often attended these sessions at great personal peril or, or risk of, of extreme personal loss. And they still attended and they still were, were extremely active during the sessions. And they still not only displayed uh, a willingness to continue on with us, but a willingness to continue spreading those messages throughout their own community. And I think standing with one another and working with one another is one of the strongest indicators of community there is. And, and earlier, uh, a definition of community sustainability was given as the persistent uh, and continued uh, ability to evolve. And I can think of no other examples where there was more persistence from that community and, and the willingness to evolve in their own gender notions of family than, than those trainings. And it was just one example of the power of uh, these, these, this work on Prevention Plus to work with communities, to shape communities and, and for communities to see us as part of that, their communities. I think that's a really brilliant example, Anthony, and thanks for sharing. And the, the, the idea of evolution also links in with just the, the flexibility that I think we needed to put in place, particularly this year, but it really came through. I don't think it will come out so much in this presentation, but it came through really strongly in the evaluation overall of how much the partners and programs really benefited from a flexible approach coming from our donor, coming from the structure of this program that when tumultuous things happened in society, we were able to find the right way to still support the community the way they need, um, in addition to like sticking to the, the initial course when it just really didn't work anymore. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and real quick, that, that uh, a huge thank you to all of our partners, uh, uh, Pramundo and Rutgers and on all of the country partners, and especially the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands, because even during COVID, I, I had anticipated far more difficulty in the shifting of, of activities and budgets to be able to, to respond to the needs, but it was just so wonderful. And it really, it really brought back to life that even though we are working with, with programs and, and through all of these different countries that there was a sense of community, even on this partner level, that we're all working together to meet the needs of, of the people on the ground, wherever they might be, whatever the situation. And that was a really heartwarming and, and powerful sense of community from the partnerships down to the communities we work with on the ground. And it was really appreciated by them and us as well. Thank you so much for your time, Anthony. Sorry that it's Thank just you. a short window, but um, uh, right. really added certainly um, real substance to our vision of community sustainability. And Damien, maybe um, let's conclude this this bubble with the next piece. Great, thank you both. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, so our next question in, indeed. <laughs> so based upon these insights around community sustainability, if you were a program manager, what one action would you take to promote sustainability? We're just building on some of those insights maybe you may have picked up from both Anthony or some of the, um, the presentation work we, we, we did there. So I'm just going to give you again one minute just to, to run through. Think from a, from a program manager perspective, what's the one action you'd take? maybe think from the perspective of one of those countries or all of the countries. Okay, so we've got some answers coming in. So identify respected community members to be the point people for the program. 
even after the funding cycle. So yeah, they're your route to sustainability. Involve communities in planning right from the beginning. Slow down project process. Make time for deep formative research. Promote community ownership. Listen, listen, listen. Work with existing structures. Inclusivity. Promote community spaces focused on building community and inner work. Take the lead from feminist organizing and women's groups. Absolutely. So promote community space. Oh, we've had that one. Community acknowledgements. Brilliant. Voting's closed. So some wonderful quick fire answers to that particular question, which is so good to get through. <laughs> Through the power of technology. Whoa. Okay, so we're going to go back to our quick quiz, picture game quiz, but this time we're going to look at institutionalization of a gender transformative approach. So we've got three recommendations here um, around that piece about institutions and how they can continue to embed and lead this work on the ground. So again, just drop into chat. What are we trying to get at here? Rather tangentially and uh, abstractly, what do our images here represent? Just drop into chat. Mapping growth and networks. Yeah. Ira got it. Application of learning. What do we mean about those things? Networking, mapping, link of development, application of learning. Okay, the big reveal, ecological approach, everyone's role, contribution counts. So this one was really speaking to the need to really continue to map out and strengthen GBV networks. A big part of the work and the results that were achieved were around networks, particularly informal networks that sprang up and formulated. You know, a, a great example there was in Lebanon of, um, you know, men who followed program app um, training, self-organized into their own, own network and started to develop, you know, think about community events that they could push forwards. So how do you continue to strengthen those particularly informal networks and ensure strong cross-sector representation and linkages between those GBV task forces and the different types of network that, that were created across the four countries, getting the cross-sector representation. Okay, um, next image. Reach out with social media. Yeah, Savita. Britt use, uh, has come up with use social media to reach out. Harold, use social media to reach communities. Leverage the power of social media. So I think we've got all, I think we've got this one. So it's lever leveraging, yes, social media, but also digital, digital platforms, particularly in this time of COVID-19, where, where our services have been so restricted. The, 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 you know, the, the kind of leveraging of digital and social media to, we to potentially reach wider audiences and provide opportunities for enhanced network networking communication, knowledge exchange. So that's been a, been both uh, a feature of COVID-19 as a driver of, of, of this requirement. Um, but in terms of uh, social media, one, one point that was raised in, uh, I think it was Uganda, where there was some negative voices using, using social media wonderfully to promote um, uh, against almost the, the values and aims of prevention plus. So it's kind of combating those kind of issues, but there was, there was certainly an opportunity there to, to leverage this. And the third one, sorry, no pictures for this, not got enough time, was long-term engagement and training strategies being needed to address the institutionalization process for key organizations and partners. So in every country, there were certain targeted institutions, um, but there was a need also to address at every level within those organizations, the training. So we found that, you know, for example, 
I think it was in Rwanda where training of media institutes, if you weren't getting right up to the editorial level within the media, a media agency who could overwrite and overrule other um, you know, stories and how they were being represented in the press, um, then you, you, you hit a bottleneck. So actually addressing across all levels was, was a key aspect. Okay, so Brian, and back to yourself again. Yeah, and I think like the last point is such a good one to set up our speakers. Like, what does it mean to go about a long-term partnership with the institution, like existing, pre-existing institutions that can take forward the types of changes that we want? And, and that could be a very promising avenue for sustainability. So actually from Indonesia, as well as Rwanda, we have speakers to, to talk to exactly that approach, a partnership with an existing governmental institution in the case of uh, Indonesia, it's the police. In the case of Rwanda, it's a district level leadership for a, a community program. And so uh, first, I'm just so excited to turn our focus to Indonesia for a few minutes and to uh, welcome Ibu Emma to the conversation. Ibu Emma is the head of the Women and Children's Unit of the Indonesian National Police. And Ibu Emma, I just invite you to share with us what you felt was the, um, the major contribution that you and your team brought to Prevention Plus. So take it away. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Brian, for your question. Uh, for, and for first and foremost, I would like to say, uh, appreciate to the invitation uh, to the main engaged symposium and hope Indonesia's listen, learns, contribute to the discourse on the prevention of gender-based uh, violence. My institution, the Criminal Investigation Agency of uh, the Indonesian National Police, or uh, Baris Krim, became involved with Prevention Plus since last year. Uh, I believe Rutgers Indonesia was in uh, the process of facilitating the development of the guideline for the investigation of domestic violence cases at the Jakarta Greeters Area Police. Uh, while that's going on, together with the Prevention Plus team for, from Rutgers Indonesia, we were discussing to the opportunity to develop the guideline that would bind police officer all over the country and not just Jakarta. And so we start the process of consultation and drafting the guideline for the handling of domestic violence by the Indonesian National Police. Uh, the guideline provides step for the investigation process of domestic violence case to ensure that these are backed up by evidences and documentation that exhibits that this reported crimes can be ascribed as gender-based violence and should we be handled with a children and gender sensitive approach. Uh, the guideline also raises the importance of having a mechanism for perpetrators counseling to prevent reoccurring domestic violence. It is currently in the process of being formalized by the legal bureau when legal, this guideline will bind more than 500 police stations across the country. Why it matters? Because uh, domestic violence cases don't carry the same weight as uh, other criminal cases. Thus, most of the time, they are not always prefer properly handled. This is indicated with the lowest number of levels of case clearance comes from domestic violence case by 20%. Having police officers handling these cases based on gender and human rights perspective will not only help the victim, the victim but also the police. Thank you, maybe. Uh, that I can say to you. Yeah, no, Ibu, Emma, it's really brilliant. And I think this is, uh, we're just really honored that you're here with us. And I think the what you've been involved with is the perfect example of this institutionalization strategy for sustainability. You're describing um, having worked closely with the Prevention Plus partner 
uh, Rutgers in Indonesia to look into how your unit is responding to GBV cases. And then like coming out of that process to be able to, I think what I have in my documentation is actually to shift the policies and procedures for 5,000 police offices throughout really like nationwide police level changes. So I think that is a, you know, a sustainable scale um, that's, that's really an amazing achievement. And we thank you for, for your work uh, to help make that a reality. Did you have any other message to share with the Thank you for your here? support. Maybe uh, 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 it's uh, enough, maybe later we'll... Okay. And um, if you could stay and maybe there will be some questions for you and thank you to Ira and the team from Rutgers Indonesia who also um, have facilitated you being here today. We really appreciate it. Um, so taking one great example of institutionalization, now let's look at another one. In Rwanda, we're so lucky to have two colleagues from Ramrik, Jonathan Munyaniziza and also Silas Gayaboshia. And Jonathan and Silas have had the chance to work closely with them over the past few years. And Ramrik's approach has partnered very closely with the leadership of one particular district, Karongi district. And there's actually a nationwide government program in Rwanda called the Parents' Evening Dialogues. It's a monthly meeting for really all the families, all the adults in every village nationwide to come together and talk about the pressing issues uh, taking place in that country. But there hadn't, hadn't been a gender transformative perspective or really focus on GBV from a feminist gender transformative lens prior to Prevention Plus. And uh, I just want to turn it over. I think Jonathan will speak to really the, the strength of that particular district level uh, work and the outcomes. And Silas, I think, will speak to exactly how did that partnership work in a functional way between um, Rumrick and the district leaders. So maybe Jonathan, I think you were going to take it away first to just share some of your major takeaways from this institutional partnership. Okay, uh, thank you, Brian, for this opportunity uh, to share our experiences and uh, lessons learned for, from the implementation of uh, Prevention Plus in the Karongi district. Um, the implementation of, uh, of Prevention Plus uh, in the Karongi district used the parents' evening dialogue as uh, an effective model for the sustainability of prevention work uh, in Rwanda. Uh, parents' evening dialogue is a, a government structure operating in, at the village level. It was uh, created to provide the pa uh, parents an opportunity to discuss issues facing their families and find a way of a solution. As for the sustainability of uh, Prevention work prevention program, parents evening dialogue was chosen as an impactful initiative that could positively change lives of people, especially lives of couples. In this framework, uh, all community com committee members of parents evening dialogue in all villages of Karogi district well trained on the gender transformative approach. And these committee members uh, used the, the acquired skills uh, and the knowledge in the conducting discussions of PD, the PD meetings. Uh, the PD meetings were uh, conducted, well conducted in a gender sensitive way. And this has contributed to the change of uh, harmful attitude and behavior among men in the community. Uh, this helped to achieve a very positive result. Uh, for example, um, there, was, uh, there has been a, an increased understanding of men working with their, life, their wives as partners. And this has led to reduction of domestic violence. Uh, Self-confidence uh, among women and girls was increased 
And this has contributed to the equal participation of men and the women in the household property use and the management. Also, men who positively changed the attitude and the behavior act now as uh, role models to change other men. Uh, these uh, results were re uh, realized due to the close uh, collaboration uh, uh, with uh, uh, local government. And uh, indeed, the following steps were used to achieve those results where the engagement of local authorities, engagement of community, and then being the capacity of uh, PD committee members and doing a regular follow-up of PD sessions. Uh, thank you that what I can say about uh, uh, the, uh, the work of prevention plus a flu parent evening dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And I, I just want to make sure everyone heard the, the, the big numbers that we're talking about here. So in, in Indonesia, we just heard about, you know, a change at 5,000 uh, police stations. What Jonathan is describing where the RUMREC team were actually able to train the, the people who lead these monthly evening dialogues in every single village of an entire district in Rwanda. So this is like such an amazing accomplishment. It was over 500 villages that were individually trained. So you can just imagine the level of, uh, and just level of effort and training that took place. Silas, maybe to turn it to you, if you had any additional comments on how this partnership really functioned. And I think you had some idea even about the, the budget side. So take it away. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Brian. And uh, greeting, greeting from Chigali, from Rwanda, from Rwamrek again. Uh, uh, um, as per how this works out, uh, maybe I, I should first say that um, uh, PED or parents even in dialogue can be compared as just a general assembly of, uh, of a village, a village of around 50 households. So, um, and the, the way it worked, it started from the household level because in Rwanda, it is recommended that each household, each family uh, uh, develops a kind of action plan. We normally call it here performance uh, contracts. It is recommended, but it was not done. So the first step was that in the collaboration with the district, we happened to, to make sure that each family uh, develops one and that performance plans includes integrate uh, commitments, household uh, commitments on, uh, on GBV prevention, uh, not only at household level, but even in the community. So the second step was that uh, local authorities, grassroots local authorities, like cell, uh, cells local authorities also had a, a kind of um, uh, some tools to monitor the implementation, the progressive implementation of different households performance contracts, not only monitor, but also support, support uh, on the implementation. So it became, I mean, local authorities became accountable as, as far as uh, uh, GV, GBV prevention is concerned in those communities. Uh, at district level, at district level, what we can share is that gender and GBV has been incorporated in the district uh, development strategy and incorporating it, uh, maybe we should share that Rwanda has got a, a decentralized um, uh, model or approach of working and each district identifies its own priorities uh, and, and makes a budget um, that is going to implement throughout the year. So we, we managed to influence the way that the district development strategy is, is, is done and it incorporates a GBV and gender, uh, uh, GBV prevention as a cross-cutting issue. At district level, again, 
uh, we should share about the way uh, I mean stakeholders, different stakeholders have been held accountable in mainstreaming uh, gender transformative approach. Uh, before some of them were believed just to be concerned about projects intervening in agriculture or a different area without a high knowledge about how gender and GBV can have uh, uh, impact on their own interventions. So uh, a forum at district level has been established so as to monitor and regularly uh, monitor the progress of how gender and GBV uh, are being mainstreamed uh, in their own uh, interventions. We can also share that not only uh, those stakeholders have in, uh, in, uh, mainstreamed gender in their interventions, but they are now recognizing how gender is bringing an added value to the expected results they were, they, 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 they were expecting. So it is like improving the way they, they, they achieve results of, 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 their, of their interventions. So uh, the, at district level, thirdly, uh, we should mention, share about uh, religious leaders because previously um, uh, Holy Scriptures seemed to be contradicting with our work, but now due to regular collaboration and capacity building, now religious leaders are recognizing that interpretation, interpretation of Holy Scriptures he supplement uh, 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 gender equality promotion work and the gender equality promotion work also supplements uh, Holy script Scriptures and maybe the success of the mandate of the religious leaders. Silas, I this is a, such an amazing example. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think you've, you've actually done my job for me because you're helping to set up the next speaker we'll hear from, who is uh, Bishop Paul, to speak to some of that uh, faith-based work in Uganda. So um, if it's okay, I really hate to cut you short, but I think so we keep to the time. Um, if there's any like very burning last comment, otherwise I just want to thank Jonathan, Silas, and Ibu Emma again for this vision of um, institutionalization. Uh, sorry, Silas, any, any just final notes? It's okay. It's okay. okay, it's okay, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you so much to these speakers and back to you, Damien, to, um, to close out this bubble and go to the third and final. Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody for bringing to life that, you know, what I'm sort of presenting, but with the real stories behind it all. So, um, so we're gonna go to our third and final bubble. We're on our home straight, uh, where we're looking at sustainability in terms of systems-wide thinking and, and creating sustainability through a systems-wide thinking approach. So we have um, three quick recommendations here. So, uh, because I really want to get to the final speakers. And so I'm gonna give us just 20, 20, 30 seconds to have a think through What's this recommendation? Again, we're going to chat. Abstract thinking. Co-authors. Collaborative strategy. Flexibility. Develop your strategy, flexibility. Yep, there's definitely strategy and flexibility going on here. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, so this is all about developing strategies that need to be flexible and responsive, particularly when we're speaking to these emergent needs of an evolving GBV prevention and response system. So we've used that word quite a bit, emergent, evolving, new roles coming through in order to really support those, those changes um, that, you know, and, and, and these responses to new insights and new knowledge um, and new leadership taking different roles, whether that's men or women, um, strategies of those who are, you know, uh, there to support this work emerge 
um, need to be flexible and responsive to those needs. So that's something that came across in all three, uh, all four countries. Um, so again, the, we're looking very much here at the programmatic level, what was common across all places. Here we've got examine the GBV response process and the roles that key actors play in it to make effective recommendations concerning how GBV reported reporting can be simplified and made easier for victims. So this was, um, again, speaking to the wonderful work that was undertaken to both map out, create new networks, and in some way, the visibility became clear of, of, of some of the complexities around reporting, some of the, 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 the different actors had to play in that process, which made potentially things quite difficult for victims to, to engage and report. Um, so that with that visibility, there was some uh, uh, potential now to really understand how this can be made easier. So our final picture question of our day, our picture quiz, and somebody's a winner, surely. Idea sharing. Forums for sharing. Okay, I'm going to give it a reveal because I know that we're a bit pushed for time. Okay. Share, creating forums for sharing lessons learned, for example, from the institutionalization process, and but all other areas of shared interest amongst GBV prevention practitioners and develop, showcase, and disseminate that learning across the system. So this was a really prominent one that, you know, that, 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 that Prevention Plus was already leveraging well networks, but there was, you know, four countries, different approaches, different insights, different learnings coming from each of these processes, and one could feed off the other for sure. So um, that, that formalization of that exchange of knowledge was something that was a strong recommendation going forwards at this, you know, uh, at this particular level. And the final recommendation here is provide backbone support. And what we mean by that is in terms of accountability, governance, uh, supporting communications, particularly for informal networks. So these have, these have flourished, these have grown, but how do they sustain over the long term without some, you know, the very magic of them has been the informality of them in some instances. But as they grow, there is a requirement for more support to ensure that those, those networks can have purpose and can flourish in the long time. So that's just a sense of uh, the system's wide recommendations and uh, I'll hand back to Brian. Thanks a lot, Damien. And I think, um, you know, when you think about the kinds of, uh, you, the second recommendation you showed was the, the key actors that are out there working to shape the realities around GBV, uh, and also a particular actor that sort of exists across all levels of the system from the individual upward. I think the faith community and faith practice is a really good example of that, where it manifests in individuals, faith-based practices. It's a space for community meeting, but it's also an institution and a powerful one in its own right. So we're very honored that uh, Bishop Paul Masaba Kipto from Uganda is here with us because Bishop Paul has played such a leadership role in uh, organizing faith leaders in Uganda to be in support of uh, gender equal messages and interpretations of scripture, even in an interfaith way. And so Bishop Paul, I would just really give the floor to you now to share with us uh, some of what you felt were the most impactful contributions from your side of the Prevention Plus project. I hope you're there, Bishop Paul. Did we lose you? You'll have to unmute yourself. Oh. It seems that maybe his name dropped off. Let's see. He was struggling. It's really talk. unfortunate because he yeah. was with us even a few minutes ago. I even sent him a message five minutes ago in the chat um, saying that you're about to be up. <laughs> Uh, so um, let's continue to make uh, texts and messages to Bishop Paul for the next 60 seconds or so. But I wonder, uh, we do have representatives from Reproductive Health Uganda and also um, Sanke who maybe could step in 
to speak to Bishop Paul's role. Is there a volunteer? I'm looking, yeah, um, maybe Sam. Hello, if you Paul could coming just... back in now, actually, Brian. Oh, okay, 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 great. Let's see if we get him quickly. Uh, Reverend Bishop Paul, can you hear us now? Ooh. You know, the 10, 10 speakers on one Zoom, there was always going to be a challenge. Bishop Paul, are you back? Hmm. Yeah, I must be having some, some difficulty with his uh, video and audio. Uh, Sam, is your connection okay at the moment? I hate to put you on the spot, but maybe just like a very brief overview of the inter the Faith Leaders Forum. Hello? Yes, we hear you, Sam. Yes. Uh, yes, of course, uh, Dr. Dr. I mean, Bishop Paul is trying to reconnect, but he could still... Uh, speak something around the, the work of uh, the Faith Leaders Forum. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. I think, please go ahead. Just unfortunately, the time is so tight. We'll continue to try yes. with Bishop Paul, but uh, yeah. Of go course, ahead. in prevention, prevention plus uh, uh, program in Uganda, among the, <clears throat> the strategies, uh, for example, for reaching out, addressing uh, issues of interventions at the institutional level was to engage the different institutions and when we looked at the religious institutions we came up with an idea of uh, <clears throat> forming and then strengthening the faith leaders forums it's a forum that brings together uh, several religious leaders and we have a couple of them in the country we have so like any other country we have the catholics uh, the born again the Muslim community, the Seventh-day Adventist, about five categories. So all of them to bring them to a round table, to come to the common agenda and be able to have common voice towards the fight against gender violence. So this is the forum that is formed in all the three districts where the project has been implemented. And uh, within these forums, uh, they have the chair, and for this, specifically for Capturo region, where Bishop Paul happens to be the chair. Um, and his work has been really great. And uh, they, have, they had a lot of training from the program on gender transformative approaches. And therefore, also given the different models uh, that we've been using in the program, which they have applied and also try to get this training within their institutions. And uh, these uh, religious uh, forums, they go through their own local structures within the church, within the mosque, within the Catholic church, the Protestant and all that. So those small structures, they integrate the different messages talking about the gender-based violence uh, prevention using those different models. So we have seen uh, an improvement in terms of couples being taken through the different sessions, these different counseling sessions to promote gender equality before they are fully married. And uh, we have structures like Mother's Union, we have the Father's Union. So those are the structures within which there's been integration of these messages. But also for purposes of sustainability, we made sure that uh, through faith forums, some of this is documented through the different, uh, in the different uh, materials that they use within the church, within the mosque, so that there is continuity. And the whole idea was, first of all, to use the existing structures within the faith forums so that there is sustainability. But at the same time, also ensuring the religious leaders whom we've uh, called at the beginning gatekeepers have a common voice common agenda and also do advocacy jointly. But one thing that's very interesting and uh, which we are proud of, we're talking about, is that we are looking at religious leaders now, faith leaders, not as gatekeepers as how we're 
perceiving them to be at the start of the program. Today, they are champions and they are allies in the fight against gender-based violence. So, first of all, the issue is, or the lesson we're learning here is that the point is about the exposure, the involvement of the faith leaders, giving them the information, involving them in the discussion, and making them part and parcel of the program. And of course, bring them at the very beginning of the program was a very key strategy in ensuring that there is sustainability. And having said that, within the country, we have, we have what we call Interreligious Council of Uganda. That's a biggest forum, the biggest structure of the national level. So the religious, the faith leaders, the district level now, they have this representation at the national level. And currently they are pushing all the, our interventions, all the good work within the district to be integrated. And so that at the national level, so we see uh, the integration of gender transformative approaches. Um, Sam, of speaking of champions, you're just really a champion yourself for stepping in uh, in, in Reverend uh, Bishop Paul's absence. <laughs> Hello. We really appreciate it. Yes. And, and on top of that, uh, we're also talking about the amount of motivation for faith leaders is their involvement is reaching out to them. And so, of course, it's unfortunate we would have loved to hear the real voice of Dr. Arada. Yes, I am on. <laughs> yes. Okay. I am on. Bishop Paul, <laughs> we missed you for oh, a few minutes. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I want to thank Sam for stepping in. I had some, I think, some complication on the network. Well, we really appreciate your trying to reconnect, and we've been celebrating your work for the last five minutes. I don't know if you have just like a one minute overall uh, capturing of your your success and your lessons from the Prevention Plus yes. project, but we're a little running late on the time now, unfortunately. Oh yeah, let me just in a few minutes thank. Uh, I want to thank everybody um, for the for the powerful engagement. However. Um, I'm the chairperson of the uh, Faith Leaders Forum in Kapchorwa. I'm also the chairperson of the uh, Civil Society Organizations Alliance. And by God's grace, I'm the bishop of Sebei Diocese in Eastern Uganda. And I'm a champion um, in um, issues to do with gender-based uh, violence, FGM, and all other uh, cultural issues. We, I have contributed a lot in the Prevention Plus project, uh, which has done commendable work in this region. I want to uh, point out a few things, including uh, information and, uh, and the review of the final evaluation processes. We advocate for integration of gender-based violence, FGM, uh, messages into our religious uh, teachings. Um, also, the mouthpiece uh, for uh, the project, both at national and uh, and the district level. Um, we've been able to um, influence the uh, interreligious council of Uganda to advocate for uh, gender-based violence and. FGM issues. I also influence the participation of uh, women uh, celebration days, the Father's Days, Culture Days, uh, Day of the African Child, and, and I use uh, celebrations. All these uh, contributions uh, which we've done uh, with Prevention Plus project. But also, we have been able to do a lot um, in achieving uh, platforms that bring together all, all religious leaders together, uh, regardless of our denomination. But we come together as denominations and talk same language. We talk uh, same issues that affect our people uh, without discrimination. We have a common good of transforming the livelihoods of our people. We have a platform that 
bring together all the structures within the religious organizations. And we have a system that goes down to the grassroots. We have organizations of women, we have groups of youth, we have groups of uh, men, both married and married, and unmarried. All this is a structure that enables us to uh, continue reaching out to our people. We've also been able to influence our religious leaders at all levels to integrate the teachings of uh, gender-based violence in their sermons. So we use the pulpit uh, to teach and also to help people to practice uh, good behavioral changes that enables uh, families to stay at peace. But also we have been reorganized as stakeholders with the governments of Uganda and also at the district level, whereby all our leaders, we are consulted whenever the government or local government want to uh, pass out uh, certain regulations and guidelines policies, we are involved. So we play a very big role in also um, supporting and uh, contributing towards uh, the policies that take place within our region. So basically in a few minutes, I want... Now you've done brilliantly, you, Bishop Bong. I pray that uh, God lead each one of you. <laughs> yes. We're yeah. grateful that the, the storm clouds parted in Thank the you. hills of Kapchorwa so that your internet could reconnect and you can join us. Um, and thank you so much for all your amazing work uh, in organizing the, these various forums. Uh, I think just in the yeah. interest of time, uh, we've had such a rich session today and I think the participants are, of this session can see the, the just volume and richness of work happening under Prevention Plus and, and uh, what an what a enormous and complex program it really is. So maybe let's turn then to the to the conclusion of everything. Um, back to you, Damien. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks for the um, those great speakers. Um, well, listen, we're done on our presentation side, um, and I think we're over we're over time. But we have got through an enormous you know agenda. Really, we we were a bit nervous at the outset of this with with about 12 speakers, uh, mm -hmm. but we've done very well. <laughs> uh, but we do come to our final. Uh, our final speaker today. So I'm going to hand back to Harold um, just to, to introduce uh, Tom. Yeah, I would like to give um, the floor to Tom, um, who will give uh, closing comments. And um, uh, so it's um, the floor is uh, yours, Tom. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, sorry that you can't see me. Somehow the, the, the camera didn't work today. I don't know what it is, but it's probably also tired of all the Zoom meetings and Teams meetings we've had and it's all already gone off on its holiday. But well, thanks for this really, really great meeting. Um, I think it's been a very, very rich overview of what's been happening, but also it, it gives the uh, clear overview of how rich the results are of uh, Prevention Plus. And I really want to thank uh, Damien Hatton and, and his team to, for this work and, and not only for doing the work and, and having the interaction. And I also heard from the colleagues that it has gone in a very constructive and very positive way, but also this way of presenting and involving everyone um, in, in actually making sure that the results are also clear, but also being discussed and reflected upon. I think that is the added value because I think the work is never done. Um, and even though, I mean, when we look at it and also when we look at no matter which country in the program we focus uh, on, whether it's Lebanon, Indonesia, Rwanda um, or Uganda, I think it's, it's very uh, rich in terms of the results that were booked, but also quite sustainable. Of course, we never know what, what's, what's going to happen in the very far future, but at least there is a strong basis uh, for a lot of the work that has been done, but also in order to uh, continue that. I think uh, I want to thank all of you, not only the participants here, but also the organizations that have been involved in this uh, program, because I think this is really always about people getting involved, organizations getting involved, but especially people and professionals getting into it with 
their minds, but especially also their hearts, because that is very important to bring this uh, work further. And I think that is that has been very strong in uh, Prevention Plus. Um, I definitely want to recognize the donor, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and not only as a donor, but because the ministry is definitely a partner, and the partner in terms of having a real dialogue on, on where we are, but also how to continue, and a partner also to show that flexibility when it was needed was really there, and especially this year with quite some challenges uh, due to COVID, due to other uh, circumstances, the, the, the crisis in Lebanon, I think it, it all um, really sort of brought, the, well, we needed to come to new decisions and the ministry has been extremely supportive uh, there. And I think that that's really uh, valuable in a, in a program and in a partnership uh, like this. Of course, the partner organizations in, in all the countries, I've, I want to recognize especially also uh, our colleagues in Indonesia, but also the, the partners in the other countries, because I think you've done great, great, great work and you've been very flexible here. So I know we're running out of time. Um, so I want to also close off because I want to close off not because this program is ending. It is ending, of course, and then we're really getting close to the final date. But I think it's also a starting point, a starting point for new work that we'll engage in with the Generation G uh, program. And I think this overview of results, but also of lessons learned, gives us a very strong basis to continue uh, the work. And I think I think um, this is really important uh, in partnerships like these, building on uh, the partners involved, uh, but even bringing it to a next level. And I think that is a challenge that we're all uh, up to. And I think that's also where we all want to bring our energy uh, to. So I really want to thank all of you, and especially also Men Engage Global, for giving us the opportunity to have this uh, meeting in this uh, uh, in, in this uh, way. Um, but let's continue to work. Uh, but let's also enjoy the break uh, during the holidays and get some time off. Uh, but then also start continuing again in the new year. But thank thanks to all of you. Really proud of the work that has been happening. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I think that that closes it out beautifully. Just one last task. Um, it wouldn't be right as an evaluator if we didn't pose a few questions about today's session. So um, I'll open our final poll. Um, no, no. no oh, there we go. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for today's session. Um, and for everybody's patience with the timing and the connections, uh, it's been a great, uh, a great session overall. And um, hope to see you again all soon. But if you've got thirty seconds just to uh, just to complete our our survey, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Damien, also for playing such a big role in this presentation and for all of the great work by um, in focus throughout every stage of the evaluation. We know we've uh, placed a lot of expectations and demands on you with the three different evaluation areas and many different styles of presentation of the results. And you've done you've done really, really well um, within four countries, the four <laughs> countries. Yeah. Two within, years yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'll, um, thanks to the, I, I wrote in the chat as well, the time was short, so there wasn't able to be a Q&A session, but my email is there in the chat and we just encourage you to reach out to any of the organizers of this session if you want to be put in touch with any of the teams or have a question that we can answer. Um, but I'll, I'll sign off with that. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone.